Our next speaker is from Columbus, Ohio. He works with an incubator called ForgeX, and specifically uh, is working on a startup called Step It Up. The neat part of this product is, is, is a software as a service educational platform where they're gamifying and experimenting with different ways to educate and onboard a workforce. Jared's had an interesting career, especially now being in a young company, having a software engineering background, he's now starting to wear dual hats, uh, having operations responsibilities and works with uh, DevOps concepts. So please join me in welcoming Jared. He's going to be talking about serverless architecture. Is that better? There we go. Uh, thank you, Warner, for that introduction. As you said, uh, my name is Jared Olson. I work here in Columbus, Ohio, at a company called Step It Up. There we go. Uh, you can get to our awesome website there at getsteppitup.com. Um, I just tweeted out the uh, link to these slides, which is a little bit easier than that big, long URL there. So if you want the links to those slides, you can get to them on Twitter as well. Um, so architecture, right, is the foundation on which the uh, systems that we build are based upon. Uh, the, the decisions that we make today around architecture are going to impact us or potentially somebody else uh, for years to come. So that's kind of why we spend a lot of time talking about architecture, because without a nice, solid foundation, you can kind of end up with something that looks a little bit like that. Hopefully that's not your guys' systems. Uh, but bad so software architecture can lead to many problems, one of which inability to scale, slow performance, increased time to deliver new features, and loss of income, which is less than optimal. Uh, traditional software systems are horribly inefficient. It's estimated that about 80% of IT budgets are spent simply keeping the lights on, and typical servers in a data center deliver between 15, 5 and 15% of their maximum computing output on average throughout the year. So why is it that we have so much waste? Well, downtime, downtime costs money, right? A great example of this is uh, Amazon.com. Since they are such a high traffic website, it's estimated that a second of downtime costs them about $1,000 in missed sales. Uh, they went down for about 30 minutes in 2013, I think it was. And uh, it was estimated that that cost them about $2 million in missed sales. Now, those uh, missed opportunities aren't always at the time of the event. Um, anybody remember Delta and what little snafu that they had? Uh, I think that was in August of this year. Um, they were down for a day and basically had no flights moving anywhere. And it's estimated that the ripple effect from that has cost them about $150 million, which is less than optimal. So what is serverless? So what you do is you go to your data center, you go to your blades, and you rip them out, and now you're serverless. <laughs> just kidding. There's still servers involved. Uh, so it's an approach uh, that can help with some of the problems that we just had on one of the previous slides there, inability to scale, high cost of running servers 24-7. Um, so obviously there are still servers involved somewhere, but the uh, term serverless, I think, is kind of a confusing name because there's a couple of things that fall underneath the umbrella of serverless, and we'll kind of dissect those and talk through them here a little bit as well. The first one is backend as a service, or BaaS, is, which is more about embracing third-party services to offload some of the facets of your system. For example, file storage, authentication, video processing, things like that, that other people have already built some services for us that we can kind of leverage to help with those tasks. So that's kind of one, of one part of serverless is backend as a service, and the other is function as a service, which is an approach to executing your business logic that is completely maintained by a third-party service provider, so you don't have to maintain servers, pick which operating system you're using, update security patches, things like that. Your service provider pretty much handles all that for you. By the way, if you guys have questions, feel free to go ahead and stop me if you want to. Uh, when, when you have the thought pop in your head, it's a good time to stop. So back end as a service are 
third-party services with simple APIs to handle common back-end features, for example, authentication and authorization, push notifications, storage, et cetera. One great example of a back-end as a service is S3. Does anybody use Amazon S3? So basically what it is is a file storage. You throw files at it, it stores it, you can retrieve them. You don't have to manage your servers, don't have to figure out which file system is going to be the best for your environment. Right? You just throw stuff at it and it stores it. Another example is a uh, whole company called Firebase, which was purchased by Google. Um, they offer an entire suite of backend as a services here. So they have a real-time database, authentication, cloud messaging, storage, hosting, blah, blah, blah. You can see their graph there. So a little bit of an example of a traditional system, like a web-based system. You would have your application server, and somewhere out there, there's clients that are trying to get to your server. Let's say, take the example of trying to save a file or upload a picture or something like that. The way that this would work is that client or browser would initiate a request with your application server and say, hey, I want to, serve, I want to save this file. Here you go. With backend as a service, you can still have your application server sitting there you know, doing whatever it is that it, it still needs to do. The client browser, though, can interact with backends as a service to handle different aspects. So for example, you could use Facebook to get the authorization token, use that authorization token then to directly upload the file to S3. So as you notice here, compared to our last picture, we have no interaction now between the client and the app server. So the app server can effectively just go away, hence serverless. So back end as a service, the big thing with it is, you know, why reinvent the wheel? I'm sure that uh, all of us that develop applications and support applications have to deal with storing of files, right? Amazon S3 is very good at that. It has a single responsibility of pretty much just doing that for us. Um, so it's kind of more so about embracing that and offloading that aspect of our application to somebody else that that's pretty much their only responsibility. I see it fitting in well with startups and new projects. Um, I know with a lot of time with legacy projects, it's a little harder to kind of do drastic shifts. Um, I have you know, shifted from using thing X to using S3 uh, to store files, so it is possible. But I think that uh, a lot of times with startups and new projects, it's a little bit easier to kind of pick your tooling and what you want to use. And at the end of the day, uh, with this and with most things in our uh, industry, I think evaluating it from a cost savings perspective is a good approach. Uh, you know, if moving to S3 can save you X percent over what you're currently doing today, you know, maybe it's worthwhile looking into. And that's pretty much back end as a service. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about function as a service. So what function as a service is, is stateless, stateless compute containers that are event triggered, last a short time, and are fully managed by a third party. Oops. I lost the link there. Okay. So a lot of people say, well, isn't that just the cloud, right? No, it's not. Uh, Amazon, Microsoft, HP, Dell, they all have cloud service providers where you can buy servers with 128 cores, two terabytes of RAM, more disk space than we need, right? And you end up with deciding on what operating system you want to install, installing tools that install tools, install tools with those installers, have an upgrade plan for those tools, have an upgrade plan for the operating system, have to be responsible for updating security patches, manage it all with scripts that look like that, monitor it all with a dashboard that looks like that, and at the end of the day, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> so how is uh, function as a service different? Well, in the definition, we said it was stateless, right? Which is a little bit of a shift from more traditional systems today. Most of the applications that we write or have written over the past 10 years or so are stateful, you know, web containers, things like that. Um, this allows for excellent horizontal scalability, um, which is all provided from the third party uh, provider that runs your function as a service. So with that, right, it, it has the ability to automatically scale your code to handle almost any amount of workload that you throw at it. Event triggered, uh, pretty much an event is, really could be almost anything that you can think of, right? Where 
technical people. Uh, we can think of very imaginative things, but pretty much anything out there that you could think of could be an event. Could be an HTTP request, could be a file upload, uh, could be an event dropping into a queue. You know, pretty much anything that you can think of uh, could be an event that triggers your function to be invoked. It lasts a short time, so the idea there is that it, as needed, it can spin up new instances of your function, execute, shut down, and just completely go away. And it's all managed by your third-party provider, so you don't really have to deal with any of, any of the auto-scaling or anything like that. So uh, a function you know, is very similar to a function in any programming language that you can think of, right? It's just maybe a single method or um, you know, an executable inside of a class, anything that you can think of is pretty much the way that I like to think of a function. So basically the way that you configure one is you say, all right, well, here's my code. It's, you tell it what runtime you want to use, and with AWS's Lambda, you can choose Java, Python, Node, so you can say, here's my code, it's Java. This is where you call when you get invoked, and this is how much memory I want to use. And with AWS, you can choose anywhere between 128 megs and one and a half gigs. And that's pretty much all that it takes to set up a function. And it's up in production, now it's sitting there waiting to be invoked. Uh, one of the very very cool things that I think with function as a service is that my code is actually not executing right now. So think back with our systems, right? We would start up a, a Tomcat, something like that, deploy a war file, and it's sitting there waiting to handle requests. And if we don't have enough resources on that server, enough servers to handle all the requests coming in, right, our website potentially goes down or aspects of our system no longer work. Whereas with function as a service, it's just sitting there waiting for an event to happen to come in to decide whether or not it needs to spin up a new instance. So when the event out there in the system happens, it triggers our function. It says, well, I don't have an instance that can handle this request. Let me spin up a new one, handle the request, and send it back to the requester. So now it's time for a little live coding demo, which never goes wrong, right? So if uh, you've used uh, AWS at all, this should look fairly you know, familiar to you. Uh, the uh, Lambda compute lives underneath the uh, AWS's compute resources here, underneath EC2, in the top left up there. Uh, but you click on it, and you can say, let's get started with Lambda right now. Uh, it does, has a whole set of blueprints here for you, uh, so just some examples to kind of play around with. Um, some of the cool ones are you can set up Alexa commands, so if you want to write your own commands to control your Alexa, you can do that. You can also set up custom uh, slash, Slack slash commands, and you can kind of see here, there's where those <laughs> blueprints for those things reside. We're not gonna use those today. We're just gonna set up a one ourselves. So the first thing that you would do is uh, configure your trigger, right? What's the event that occurs out there somewhere that invokes your function? So you get this whole drop down here. Uh, you can say API gateway, you can do a schedule if you want to do something like a batch job or a cron job. Um, object being uploaded to S3, lots of options there. We're going to leave this blank for our example and we'll configure an API gateway outside of this. So we can come in here and we'll say, this is our hello world function, because that's what you have to do when you're first learning something is hello world, right? You select your runtime. Um, the nice thing about Node.js is that we can just write our code right here into the uh, browser for us. So we're, we're going to do that. If you're using uh, Java, Python, or doing something more production-ish, you'd probably upload an artifact that contains all your code, but this will work for us. So right now you can see that the only thing that it's doing is invoking the callback method and saying hello from Lambda. As with most things inside of AWS, you have to uh, assign roles to things, which really just kind of control your permissions and what the Lambda can talk about or can communicate with. So if you have an RDS that's running in your uh, AWS Lambda environment, you would need to make sure that the role is configured appropriately to allow this Lambda to talk to that resource. Uh, since we're not gonna be communicating with anything else, we can just use the default Lambda basic execution here. 
as I stated, we can choose our memory selection here, which we don't even need 128, so that's what we'll go with. And then in a production environment as well, you'd probably want to configure the VPC and the subnet and all that stuff, and you can do so down here. We'll just click Next and tell it to create the function. So congratulations, our function has been created. So that's kind of that box that we had in that picture a couple slides ago, right? Our Lambda is there, the function's live in production and able to be invoked. So now we just have to configure our trigger for it, which we can do in the API gateway. So they try to, try to help you out here, but we're just gonna say, nope, we're gonna create a new API gateway, call it the serverless demo. We'll create a resource of hello world. then assign a method. So we're gonna choose post. And then it asks me, I guess I could probably make that bigger for you. Um, ask me what I wanna do when this method gets invoked and I wanna invoke a Lambda function. I'm gonna choose my region, which I'm gonna choose the best region, US East 2, which is hosted in. Columbus. There you go. <laughs> I think that was like two, two or three weeks ago that they uh, just released that. 12 days ago. We'll click Save, which adds a permission to our Lambda. And now the all important step of deploying the API. And what, what are we gonna do? We're gonna go straight to Prod. So now we have this nice long URL here that we can take, and I have to use my cheat sheets. And go to the command line. Um, so what we're doing here is, I'm doing a date function to give us a little bit of a timing uh, so that we can see how long this takes to invoke. We're gonna do a curl post to our URL and then another date, which hopefully will show about a second or so of time that it took to invoke that function. So you can see there, it took about a second, and we got our response that we put in to our Lambda of hello from Lambda. Now, if we want to expand on this a little bit, oops, what we can do is back in our Lambda configuration, we can change this callback to try to read something from the request that's coming in or the trigger that invoked our function. So we're gonna refer to that as the event.name, which is one of the uh, inputs into this function. And we're gonna say, hello, these pretzels are making me thirsty. Does anybody know what that's from? Seinfeld, Seinfeld that's right. So now we can grab that statement, and what we're doing here is we're just saying, we're, po we're doing a post with a body uh, that has the name and Jared, and we should get a response that says, hello Jared, these pretzels are making me thirsty. So, that is our little demo there. Oops. So for Amazon Web Services, what does this cost? Well, they charge you based on the uh, gigabyte per second that you use of compute time. So you're only paying for the time that your code is executing. And if you're using 128 megs like we were, uh, you're using 0 0.00000208 seconds for every 100 millisecond of processing time. Uh, so what that works out to is about 1 60,000th of a cent for every gigabyte per second used. And for every 1 million requests that come into your Lambda, you pay an additional 20 cents. So what that works out to is if you had a million requests come in, your process was using a gig of memory, and each one of those million requests took a second, you'd be paying uh, just under $17 for all of that. So what are some of the pros to taking a serverless architecture approach? At the end of the day, it can save you money. Um, the fact that you're only paying for 
execute time and you, with function as a service. And usually with backend as a service, you pay for um, a certain level, right? So with authentication, maybe you pay for every 100 active users or every 1 million logins or whatever. Um, you can kind of compare that to what you're doing today, and it could potentially save you money. It also provides great horizontal scalability. So Amazon obviously has data centers all over the world and is continually expanding on their data centers and their compute powers and whatnot. Um, and they, prov they completely manage everything when you're doing the function as a service to make sure that you have enough instances of your function out there ready to handle any request load that comes in. Which at the end of the day, that allows you to focus more so on your business and kind of what's making you as a company more money instead of making sure that your operating systems are up to date with the latest security patches, right? Every server that we have out there is running a consistent version of Java, things like that. So when should you use uh, serverless architecture? I feel like it's, uh, very, it's built very well for a uh, microservices approach. If that's the direction that you are currently in or exploring, you know, I think that looking at using function as a service and backend as a service are great ways to use, uh, to kind of help build out your microservices. Processing items in a queue. Um, if you don't have a ton of traffic coming into the queue, you have something that's sitting there pulling it every 10 minutes, you know, running, 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 and you have a server running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that can get expensive. Whereas with function as a service, you can simply listen to that, and when something's there, you pay for the compute time that you use, which could be you know, a couple hundred milliseconds, maybe three or four seconds a day, whatever it is. If your traffic is highly inconsistent or unknown, um, using a serverless approach to get the awesome horizontal scalability of an infrastructure like Amazon's could be very beneficial. Um, you know, it's really bad when you release a product like Pokemon Go and nobody can connect to your servers, right? I'm, I would assume that, I don't have any numbers on it, but I would assume that Nintendo probably lost some money uh, because they weren't able to support the demand for something being so popular as Pokemon Go. If you're developing a minimum viable product, you know, those are things that you're kind of just throwing stuff against the wall and if it sticks and you're going forward with it. Uh, these, can, these tools or these approaches can help you get up off the ground a little bit quicker than making all these changes, uh, doing all the configuration, hosting all the services yourself. Developing an Internet of Things, uh, if that's something that you're into as well, I think that using a serverless approach can fit well with that. So up until now, we've been all unicorns and rainbows. Is the unicorn still here? <laughs> she, she thinks she left. So what are some of the cons? Well, you are vendor specific, right? So the examples that I gave were largely Amazon based. We, you would be tied in to some degree with them. Uh, so that's one, one downside. Uh, the startup time, um, I didn't show a second request to that function that we created, but the initial request to spin up that function does take a little bit of startup time. With JavaScript, you're probably talking about two or 300 milliseconds. With Java, you, depending on what you're doing, you could be a second or two. Um, so if this was the API that's supporting your web interface, whenever you hit that threshold and you need to spin up another instance, you could incur some startup time. So depending on what your SLA is, um, that could be a determining factor on whether or not you want to use a serverless architecture. Uh, testing, so can't really run Amazon's Lambda environment on my local machine, so that doesn't really work extremely well. Uh, what you kind of have to do is just create different environments and have test, test playgrounds for developers to do their thing. Lack of tooling, uh, AWS Lambda specifically is only about two years old, so with most young things, there's not a ton of support out there. There are some uh, things out there like the uh, project called Serverless Framework that are trying to address some of those issues, but I think that like with most young things, we got a little bit of room to grow there. And when should you not use a serverless architecture? Uh, in general, I think that this is good advice, that don't go looking for a problem to fit a solution. Um, Sometimes when you see a shiny new thing that looks really cool, you want to go out and you know, completely change your whole infrastructure to use it. Um, if it doesn't make sense to you to use a serverless architecture, you know, don't use it for your work stuff. You can use it for play stuff um, if you want to. Like I personally built something that uh, checked Amazon, or not Amazon, Apple inventory to see if the new watch was in stock at our local Apple store, um, which was 
fun and only took me about 15 or 20 minutes to set up. Um, if it's going to cause problems downstream, so if you have a set of application servers that are currently getting overloaded and you want some horizontal scalability there and you want to move towards the serverless framework to provide you with that horizontal scalability, um, you want to consider downstream systems and uh, downstream resources uh, before just opening up the floodgates because if you are currently only invoking those downstream systems with, let's say, 100 requests per second, and now you move to a serverless architecture that horizontally scales and it just opens the floodgates and now you're pumping 1,000 requests per second, you want to consider what, this, what effect that could have on your downstream resources. Also, stateful operations and workflows uh, could be a little bit challenging, I think, to do with uh, function as a service specifically because uh, you would manually have to do some of the rollback logic and things like that, that some other tools out there exist that do that a lot better. So closing thoughts, uh, when I first heard of serverless architecture, I was like, that is the dumbest thing that I've ever heard of in my entire life. Uh, how are you supposed to run software and host things without servers, right? But after digging into it, I feel like it's more of a terminology uh, that's just kind of like a bad name for it, I feel like. Uh, but I think that it has immense power and great potential to help us um, scale and handle large amounts of load, and as well as help get us be able to deploy new things to production very quickly. Uh, remember that you don't have to dive headfirst in the pool of serverless. You can and should probably start small with something. Maybe you've got one thing that gets invoked a couple times a day and it just kills one of your app servers. Maybe extract that out into a Lambda so that's kind of isolated and helps protect your app servers from that extra load that they don't really need. So um, I think I'm about out of time and we'll save some for questions. Here's a bunch of links if you want to take a picture of that slide uh, to some great literature around uh, serverless. But I think we could do one question. Who's the lucky recipient? Here we go. So in your examples, you showed a spin-up time of about a second. I mm -hmm. assume for a lot of applications, that would be a killer. Um, can you talk about the spin down time and if it's possible to keep um, Lambda's going hot, ready to go to keep trying to mitigate that initial spin up time? So one thing that you could try to do is to be constantly pinging. I know it's going to be vendor specific, but I know with Amazon they keep it alive for about 10 minutes. Um, so as long as you're only running one instance of that function, you could keep it alive probably for about 10 minutes or so just by pinging it every eight, nine minutes. Uh, but what you're going to incur is at some point if you need a second, third, fourth, fifth, hundredth instance of that function, is each time you have to spin up a new instance, you are going to incur that cost, or the, somebody is going to incur that penalty, essentially. Um, so I don't know if there's necessarily a good way around that problem. Great, thank you. Awesome. <laughs>